Welcome back to another episode of Focus on EDU, EdTech and the Education Experience. I'm your host, Doug Conopelko from CDW Education. And as always, excited for another guest here today. Um, a lot of people who have been in and around the education world are really familiar with a block-based coding language called Scratch. Um, but there's so much more to it than just uh, what meets the eye when you first get in there. So today my guest is Elaine Atherton, who is the director of the Scratch Education Collaborative. So we're gonna bring Elaine in, and if you could just tell us a little bit about yourself, um, your name, your role, and a little bit about your background in education. Hey Doug, thanks for having me. Um, so it's crazy to say this is my 14th year in education. Um, started out as a high school English teacher and really loved that work, loved that age group. Um, eventually, I transitioned into doing instructional coaching and uh, instructional design, curriculum design, before I transitioned into more of program management. Um, <clears throat> that's kind of really the most streamlined way to describe my pathway to working with Scratch. And I think it's always just been rooted in the fact that I love working with adult educators. Um, I also love helping them to explore their passions and unlock new possibilities through ed tech. Um, a lot of times we're working with technology that didn't exist when we were in college. I think about the fact that I got my first laptop when I was in graduate school. Um, and now, you know, kids have laptops, which is amazing. So helping uh, educators not just learn how they can apply this technology, but also recognize that there are pedagogical approaches that even uh, map on to what they're hoping to do in their classroom that they're passionate about. And so really when I'm not uh, with my family in North Carolina and enjoying better weather than a lot of people have currently in the United States, um, I'm working and I because I really just love the work I'm doing. Perfect. So let's segue right into talking about the work. So the Scratch Education Collaborative, um, what is that? What kind of work do you do? Yeah, so a lot of people are familiar with Scratch. Uh, Scratch, of course, knowing that it's a global research-based programming experience, uh, you referenced earlier block-based coding. So kids are used to using Scratch, engaging in the online community, and the SEC actually started in 2021, we're in 2022. Um, and so it's an initiative of the Scratch Foundation. And what we do is we support um, and engage participating organizations, mainly nonprofits and schools, school districts from around the world in a two year collaborative cohort experience to get people together that also have like a common North Star. Everybody wants to engage kids in playful learning and understanding computer science and exploring the possibilities that Scratch helps them to unlock creatively. And our goal is to bring those people together and help them to share their best ideas, help them to work together um, so we can support them in also implementing equitable approaches to creative coding as they use Scratch and Scratch Junior in their communities. Love it. We're going to put a pin in equitable approaches to creative coding because we need that later. But for a school or a nonprofit that um, joins the Scratch Education Collaborative, um, what does that look like? What are they doing or engaging in? What kind of work are they a part of? Yeah, so we actually have an experience mapped out that starts with several workshops. Um, and so we like to describe our first year as being the most synchronous um, of the two year experience. Year one, you're participating uh, in your orientation and then going right into five to six workshops that are every month, every other month. Workshops are two hour experiences that are developed by either someone at the Scratch Foundation, like myself with my team, or we engage our partners. Um, we have partners at organizations like the Stanford D School and the Tinkering Studio, um, as well as Microbit, because we know we don't know everything. And so we really want to leverage that uh, connective knowledge that we have. And we really focus in on helping people to understand the pedagogical approach of creative learning, but also how you can work, how others have worked in collaboration and what they've been able to produce um, as a result of working together, exploring their passions, working with peers. Um, then we also provide resources for asynchronous engagement. We have a Slack hub um, where organizations are able to post questions, share about their events, uh, engage with Scratch Foundation team members directly 
Um, why can't I connect a Raspberry Pi to Scratch Junior? Someone from Scratch can actually answer that for you. But we also have a directory that was really cool that we put together. Um, it's only for our participants. Um, one of the things we want to do is not be gatekeepers of collaboration. So we actually try to structure our directory where organizations can design their own page. And then we have our chats. So our workshops, our asynchronous communities, and then our chats, which are kind of like special topic events. Um, one thing that's a really big priority for me is supporting our organizations to work independently in order to continue this work and scale it. So even our director of marketing and communications recently did a chat where he was able to share a couple of the tools his team uses when they're trying to present messaging to the audiences that they work with, be it parents or kids or funders. And that's actually information that our organization, some of them have, team. they're a team of one. They have one staff member. Some of them have a hundred staff members, but they all can benefit from our collective expertise um, and experience. And so just as we learn from them in our one-on-one -on -one conversations that we do monthly outside of our synchronous workshops and chats, um, they're able to learn from us in our kind of regular sequence of events too. All right, we're gonna go back now to equitable approaches to creative coding. I think I got it right. So yes. um, tell me more about that. Why is that important to be at the center of the work? Yeah, so when we talk about creative coding, um, even just the development of Scratch, the creation of Scratch um, and uh, the platform, the product essentially that Mitch Resnick, Professor Resnick, created. It is intuitively and organically meant to, when we talk about low floors, wide walls, high ceilings, as far as the guiding principles for creative learning, it's meant to be inclusive. It's meant to welcome kids and uh, even adults, all kinds of learners into that environment to think creatively and express themselves. But what we know, and I think the pandemic was even a good example of this, where even if something is designed to be inclusive, and to embrace um, equity and diverse perspectives. When you don't have intentionality, you run the risk of there being exclusion. And so for us in thinking about equitable approaches to creative coding or equitable creative coding, how can we actually center um, and, uh, equity into the design approaches that educators are taking when they create these creative coding experiences for their learners in their communities? How can we make sure that it is rooted in fairness, that it is not done in a silo, that they actually engage perspectives of other people that may be in the community that are going to be influenced or affected by what they create? Um, how are we making sure that there's a shared power dynamic where every time you make something is not the same way in how you approach it. You actually take the time and root it in understanding and you also take the time to make sure that people are able to not just express their creativity, but also their culture, as well as their background and the passions that are inherent to their context around them. There's a lot to unpack there, Elaine. <laughs> a lot to unpack there. Um, let's go to community, right? This aspect of community, because obviously, uh, you know, we've talked about scratch as a as a product right and as as scratch education collaborative then as a community so why is community so important to that work so a lot of people a lot of, especially uh those that use scratch know about our online community our online community is fantastic and robust and it is just like on fire kids are resharing things they're uh, excited to be able to participate in studios um they are continually remixing things, but community looks different for adults. Um, that's the first thing. When we were starting to do this work and even talking about lessons learned for the SEC, um, collaboration looks different for adults. Like even to take a step back before you're even talking about community, just collaboration. Um, when people say, oh, we're gonna collaborate, you should work together, collaborate. That's, you, we're in a virtual environment. I've never met you in person. We may not speak the same language. We're not in the same geographic region. We don't even eat the same food. Um, you know, it's something, so many things like that we take for granted. And then we say, do something together. There has to be scaffolding. There really has to be grounding experiences where people start to build empathy for each other and feel the need and want to be kind to other people. 
So then when you are asking them to collaborate, they're collaborating not just because they see there's a need for both of you to build something together, but they actually care about how you engage with it and how you're talking to them and how you feel while you're doing it. So we try to structure our workshops to facilitate experiences like that through the different activities. So by the time we do ask people to collaborate, they have it. They feel like they're part of a community. They feel like they're speaking a unique dialect. They feel like they've had, you know, common points of reference. They've seen their faces even on the Zoom meetings. They're very engaging in the uh, in our synchronous workshops and chats. So when you have a community and you're talking about sustainable practices, things that are going to outlive all of us, that's where community comes in. And that's why to me, it's so important. Community is what moves you from connection where it's like, I know a guy that does a thing that can do another thing with a different guy. Instead to, I actually want to work with Doug because Doug's cool and I like what Doug is doing and we can learn from each other and we're gonna make something new together. I love it. I wish I was uh, more gifted with like animation. So when you're saying like, I know a guy and he does a thing and we could like have little people on the screen doing that as we go. Um, I imagine the first guy that I mentioned to be like a plumber for some reason, like somebody that like has a hammer. He has to have a, a plunger or a hammer, something like really tangible it. for home stuff. He's got a tool and the other guy yeah. needs the tool. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Um, so what are the things uh, that you found that drive success for either Scratch or the collaborative? Yeah, so even, it's so funny, uh, I, I know I feel like a broken record mentioning collaboration, but collaboration and sharing of materials to where the organizations now feel they can localize it and remix it. What does localization mean? It doesn't just mean translating it. It means that you may have had an activity that had used a short story or a song, and that really doesn't make any sense in my particular language or culture, but I now know that I could remix it and add my own particular culture or language into it, and it makes sense for me. Um, I may not have, um, your material may stop at getting started with Scratch in Spanish, but I wanna know what you did beyond getting started in uh, with Scratch in Spanish with this particular community. Tell me about it. So now I can take it even further and remix what you did. So collaboration looks actionable. I think that's what we're seeing as a success. Um, collaboration also is, it sounds so incredible to say like it's happening across the world. We have an organization even um, in January going to visit, visit with them. They're based in Barcelona, Spain. And we actually supported through just our collaboration and connecting them with other people to build out their own tactile scratch product in order to support kids with visual impairment. They're now connecting with our SEC orgs that are in New York and doing a presentation and we're gonna have a brainstorming session. Um, that is like the highest of examples of where somebody has the means and they're able to even come across the world and show what they've done in person. But we're able to facilitate that virtually. We've had organizations um, be able to participate in each other's conferences, as well as like talk to their students virtually, um, go in person when they can in a closer geography. And then we also have our equitable creative coding resource guidance. Um, that was something that Again, getting to the idea that you can't just tell people collaborate, adults, you can't say that and hope it works. You can't just say, here's our approach to equitable creative coding. Let's see what you do. Um, we actually had to provide some guidance and it was intentional to call it guidance. Um, a guide is really check boxes. It's like steps, take this, do that, it's instructions. Guidance is advice. Um, this is our advice based on our understanding that we're continuing to build on ways you can center yourself um, in having uh, equitable approaches to your creative coding and creative learning activities that you're making. Um, so organizations are able to share their um, plans as well as share what they've created with each other. Um, we also had uh, organizations that are able to pilot different things that Scratch is not doing. Scratch Foundation, our creative learning team isn't making. Um, we have an organization based in Nairobi, Kenya. They created a gender equity resource. Um, we also had an organization that is in India that's doing a very similar type of facilitation guide for professional development. And now they're able to collaborate with each other and share that work. So our biggest successes are the ones that we usually find out 
in the middle of or even after the fact because it's moving so fast, usually in a time zone that we're not in, but we feel confident it's because we've put these people together and we actually have created the structures that they're able to just take and run with. This has been amazing and it feels like it went by in a flash, but if people want to learn more um, either about about you, about your work, or like what are some things that you've learned from, from a resources perspective, um, anything you want to shout out here, um, go ahead. Yeah, so they can visit scratchfoundation.org. That's, of course, our foundation website. You'll see links to a few blog posts that we've been able to publish talking about the SEC, also talking about uh, the work that we're trying to continue to push in moving organizations past connections into collaboration and co-design. And you can also find out information about applying to join the SEC. Um, we are currently opening our application for our third cohort. We're in 25 countries now and over 50 unique locations. And so we're just trying to break the map and see how far we can go and how many people we can continue to connect with. Well, I love it. Thank you so much for coming on today and sharing some of your story and experiences with us. Not a problem. Thank you for having us. Thanks for joining us today. Don't forget to like and subscribe so that you can be notified whenever we post new content. Looking forward to seeing you next time.